Hello and welcome to the final chapter of Guyton and Hall's Medical Physiology textbook. Today we're covering chapter 85, Sports Physiology. And before we even get started, congratulations on getting to the last chapter. It's one hell of a big textbook and I'm sure you've been through quite the journey. So let's just jump straight into this final chapter, starting off by talking about female and male athletes. Now there is some very slight differences between the average male and average female and that's due to mainly the endocrine differences. Males have more testosterone so then that's going to result in an anabolic effect and make more muscle relative to fat whereas females have more estrogen so there's going to be a propensity for deposition of fat as well in the female. So there's slightly higher levels of muscle in the male which corresponds to a difference in athletic performance. When it comes to the actual strength of the muscle that is determined by the size of the muscle, more specifically the cross-sectional area because your contractile force is going to be three and four kilograms per centimeter squared of muscle cross-sectional area. So if you have a higher cross-sectional area you have higher strength. Now the holding strength of muscle is going to be 40 percent greater than the contractile strength. And what that means is that if you have a muscle that's already contracted and then you have a force that tries to lengthen it or stretch it out, as for instance when you land from a jump you're contracted and there's a force that's trying to make you actually stretch out your muscles, that requires 40% more force than just simply shortening your actual muscles themselves. So the strength to hold your muscles in place against the force when it's already contracted is going to be greater than just contracting and shortening your muscle. Now for a few definitions, work is equivalent to the force applied to the muscle multiplied by the distance over which that force is applied, whereas power is essentially work but over a unit of time. So it's going to be work times how much time that work was applied for. So muscle power is going to be kilograms per minute. It then starts to get into differences in terms of endurance and non-endurance like sports like sprints versus marathons. That's going to be a heavy portion of this chapter. Now remember endurance sports is going to be like a long marathon where you're going to need different types of nutrients, different types of muscle remodeling, and different type of cardiovascular remodeling compared to let's say a sprinter who's going to be doing very short sharp bursts of energy. So starting off with the muscle metabolic systems, if we get a nice grounding in the muscle metabolic systems then you're going to understand which type of activity is going to use which type of metabolic system. We've already briefly talked about these in previous chapters so it's going to be a quick run through. Remember ATP is your energy currency of your cell. You will have two high phosphate bonds immediately released to provide you energy. So whenever you need energy to do something like muscle contraction, you're going to immediately cleave your ATP. That's going to diminish all your ATP within a couple seconds once you start activity. So you need ways to rephosphorylate your AMP and your ADP to re-establish ATP so then that can be used for energy. We have three methods to re-establish your ATP stores, each with a slightly different time frame. So phosphocreatine is a part of the phosphagen energy system. This is the very first one. This one lasts for about 10 seconds and it's going to just cleave your phosphocreatine into creatine and phosphate. So then this phosphate can be used to re-establish your ATP. So your phosphocreatine stores are going to be used up right away in that first 10 seconds. And then you're going to have to rely on your glycogen lactic acid system. So this is where we can break down glycogen, break down glucose into lactic acid and release four ATP molecules. Releasing those four ATP molecules, you get pyruvate. Pyruvate now would normally want to go through the oxidative system, but remember you need oxygen. If you do not have oxygen in this immediate short term period, then you can just convert pyruvate into lactic acid. And you do that because you want to get rid of the end product, so then you can keep breaking down glucose and glycogen, so then you can keep producing that ATP molecule and you don't have an accumulation of pyruvate, which is going to slow down that pathway. So this whole reaction, once again, is glycolysis. You get lactic acid as a result, but you get four ATPs. This is anaerobic respiration. This is going to last for a couple minutes, provide some more ATP. This is obviously what you're using when you're sprinting, doing very fast, short bursts of activity. And then that is also going to replenish your phosphocreatine system as well. 
So your anaerobic system replenishes your ATP, and then that is also able to replenish your phosphocreatine stores. The problem is that you actually have an accumulation of lactic acid after some time, and then you have to break that down. And to break that down, or reconvert it back to glucose, or reconvert it back to pyruvate, that's going to require ATP and, and oxygen, essentially. So you end up accumulating some products, which is going to slow you down because lactic acid causes fatigue. So this is a very short-term type of energy replenishment system. Lastly, we have our aerobic system, which uses your other nutrients, so glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, pops it into the oxidative phosphorylation system that we have previously talked about. So obviously with the word oxidative in there, we're using oxygen, then we're then using all of these foodstuffs eventually breaking them all down in the mitochondria and then we are going to spit out a whole bunch of ATP and we're able to produce a lot of ATP from this pathway but it's quite slow so you can see the aerobic system moles of ATP per minute is just one whereas the phosphagen system is very quick just four but it's immediately gone away. The aerobic system on the other hand is technically unlimited as long as you're able to replenish those nutrients and also make sure there's enough oxygen to be able to break down those nutrients or those foodstuffs. So you could imagine what type of metabolic processes you're going to use for different types of activities. The fastest types of activities they're going to use your immediate ATP stores, your phosphocreatine and your anaerobic system or your glycolysis Whereas your long endurance types of races are going to use your aerobic system with your foodstuffs and requirement for oxygen. So that's going to slightly change what kind of physiological remodeling you're going to have as well within your body. And also it will determine which diets are best for performance. Because with the aerobic system, you really want to be able to have a constant supply of nutrients going to your muscle. The best way to do that is have high levels of glycogen within your muscle and liver beforehand. So then you're able to have this big store of foodstuffs ready to go once you're doing your exercise. You can replenish those glycogen stores by eating a high carbohydrate diet a few days before the activity. And then as soon as you've done your activity, the high carbohydrate diet will be able to replenish that glycogen. So high carbohydrates, good for long endurance type races. Fats and proteins are okay, they can still replenish things, but just not as good for that replenishment of muscle glycogen. Now we should also mention this oxygen debt just here. Once you start exercising, your rate of oxygen uptake dramatically increases. As you would expect, you need to use oxygen to create your ATP, which allows you to continue your activity. Now, after you stop exercising, you've now accumulated some lactic acid, so your oxygen actually starts to be used to break down and reconvert lactic acid back to pyruvate, back to glucose. And that results in this very long, prolonged time where your rate of oxygen uptake is still going to be increased slightly, even though you've stopped the activity you know, up to 24 hours after the actual activity itself. So lactic acid causes this long, prolonged oxygen debt that you have to replace since you use that glucose initially to get that initial ATP little spurt at the price of having this lactic acid. There is this initial period where it's a lactic acid oxygen debt, meaning that it's not an oxygen debt dependent on lactic acid. It's just purely replenishing all the different types of metabolic pathways there. So moving on to athletic training, one of the major important principles principles is resistance training. Now this is just saying if you were to do a bicep curl with absolutely no weights at all, that is non-resistant training or non-load training. So that's just literally lifting your arm up and down. Now if you do that multiple times a day over 8 to 10 weeks, you're not going to really have any increase in strength, right? But if you do resistance training, we are able to actually get about 6 maximal muscle contractions performed three sets, three days a week, this is the type of growth you're going to get in this figure 85.5 over here. So you can see your percent increase in strength is going to steadily increase until about the six week mark and then you start to plateau. Because obviously if this was a linear line, we would have some pretty tremendously strong people out there. Now people are able to progressively increase their resistance training and get higher and higher strengths, but that is going to be beyond the scope of this textbook. This is really just trying to tell you 
that resistance training is the way to increase the strength of your muscle. You have to get those close to maximal muscle contractions at least six times, just three sets of that. You know, that's not too much within the day and that's going to result in an increase in strength of your muscles. Along with that, you're going to also get muscle hypertrophy. Now hypertrophy means increased muscle size. So usually what happens is just the muscles you have there just literally start to get bigger and bigger. So they start to get bigger with increased number of myofibrils. It's also going to swell with mitochondrial enzymes. It's going to increase the components of your phosphagen metabolic system, increased glycogen stores, increased fatty stores, getting ready for that muscle to do more activity. It's going to get primed so it can do that high resistance training that you've been doing every day or three days a week. The muscle's then going to prepare for it and you're going to eventually be able to do more and more. Now we do have two different types of fibers in our muscles. We have already gone over this before but let's just quickly recap it again. You have fast twitch for your sprinter like activity and slow twitch for your slow endurance type of activity. Correspondingly fast twitch is going to be a larger diameter it's going to have more enzymes for your phosphagen, glycogen, lactic acid energy systems. It's going to have less mitochondria because you're not using oxygen, you're not trying to get aerobic respiration. It's going to have less myoglobin because you're not trying to store oxygen in those muscles. And you're going to have less capillaries within your actual muscle because you don't need that oxygen supply. You're just using these initial very fast metabolic systems. Whereas your slow twitch fibers, these are going to have high blood flow, so a high amount of capillaries. You're going to have a lot of myoglobin to store oxygen next to your muscles. You're going to have high amounts of mitochondria to use the oxygen and the foodstuffs that's been brought there by that high blood flow to then convert those foodstuffs into more ATP so you can do activities for a longer period of time. Now the difference between slow and fast twitch fibers within your muscles, there is actually more of a genetic component to that. Um, and it's more just what you have is going to determine how good you can get. Um, but obviously if you're going to train your muscles, your muscles are going to get stronger, They're going, you're going to get faster, but you're going to maintain the same proportion of fast and slow twitch fibers within your various muscle groups. So obviously someone born with 100% fast twitch fibers is going to be great at jumping or a propensity to be able to be great at jumping, but they are going to find marathon training quite difficult. Now a couple graphs here just quickly explain. We have oxygen consumption on the bottom here and then we have a total ventilation at the top. This is just saying that with an increased oxygen consumption, we have a corresponding increase in total ventilation, which makes perfect sense. A nice linear relationship so you increase the oxygen consumption you increase your pulmonary ventilation now that's actually neurogenic so that's not because you've got a low oxygen so you need to increase your ventilation it's more you're stimulated to breathe faster because you're doing exercise that means that your blood gases within your body aren't going to change too much within exercise within reason unless you're going to absolutely exhaust yourself um, because you're body's prepared for it, you're going to maintain those normal levels of blood gases within your body. Now when it comes to the VO2 max, this is just telling you what the rate of oxygen usage is under maximal aerobic metabolism. And you can see here on this graph that you do have an increase in VO2 max with some training, but it's not tremendous. And the reason behind this is because when you're at full exercise capacity, you're only using about 60% of your lung capacity. And most of the limitations in getting oxygen to your muscles is actually going to come from your cardiovascular system, which we'll get to a little bit later on here. Because you need to not only diffuse oxygen across that membrane to get into the blood, you now need to get that blood to your muscles. And it's actually that portion from blood to muscles, which is the rate limiting step rather than oxygen from your lungs into your bloodstream. And that can actually increase quite dramatically that diffusion across within the athletes or even just during maximal exercise, as you can see on this little table down the bottom here. And that's because you're having some pulmonary capillaries when you're resting that are just closed off. They're not doing anything. And then that increased blood pressure and increased blood flow to the lungs just helps to increase 
the amount of blood to your lungs that can then soak up more oxygen. Now smoking severely diminishes your pulmonary ventilation. There's several reasons for that. In the short term, you're going to cause constriction of your bronchioles, increasing resistance. You're going to irritate your bronchioles and cause fluid secretion, and then also paralyze your cilia. So you're going to just clog up all your bronchi and your smaller airway passages with all this material, and it's going to be harder to get enough oxygen. Long-term chronic smoking, you're going to have some more severe long-term side effects because all of that irritation, all of that clogging, is going to result in destruction of your alveoli walls which is just severe emphysema and that's where the respiratory membrane literally gets destroyed it's just wiped out and you no longer have the ability to use that membrane to diffuse oxygen into your blood so you've just severely limited how much oxygen you can take in with each breath now getting to cardiac output the first thing is that muscle blood flow drastically increases during exercise we cause vasodilation there's increased blood pressure we send more blood through your muscles you can see that that during rhythmic exercise, the calf blood flow on the side here actually goes up and down. And that's because during contraction, during the actual muscle movement, that's going to squeeze the blood out of your muscles. It's going to fatigue it. And then as soon as you, you stop contraction there, it's going to release the blood constriction. So then blood's able to flow. So you can see the flowing of blood and then the stopping of blood quite rhythmically, but overall it's elevated compared to the resting state. Now when it comes to cardiac output, you can see that it increases linearly with our oxygen consumption, and that makes sense. Because if you increase the amount of oxygen consumption due to increased muscle workload, that's going to dilate all your muscle blood vessels and increase your venous return, so then your cardiac output will naturally increase. Now, if you chronically are working out and increasing the workload of your heart, it's going to respond by remodeling. And this is more prevalent in endurance athletes, where the body's going to say, let's get the heart, make it larger, let's give it more mass. So then now we can pump out more blood per heartbeat so we can get more blood flow to our muscles. So then we're able to do more activity. Now, correspondingly, at rest, you're still going to have the same cardiac output as a non-athlete. But since your stroke volume is so high now, because you have such a larger heart that can contract a little better and send all that blood out, you need to subsequently reduce your heart rate at rest, so then your cardiac output is going to be the same. Because remember, cardiac output is the product of stroke volume by heart rate. So if you have a high stroke volume, then you're going to reduce your heart rate to have a normal cardiac output at rest. But that means that exercise, when you increase the heart rate, with that increased stroke volume, your cardiac output increases compared to an athlete. And then that allows you to do more activity and get more oxygen to your muscles that you need. But it's important to note that during maximal exercise, your heart rate and stroke volume are operating at 95% of their maximum compared to our respiratory system, remember, which is operating at 60% of its maximum. Now your respiratory system is like that, so then you've got some reserve. If you have some illness or you're at altitude and there's less oxygen around, you can still increase your ventilation, or let's say it's really hot outside, you can increase your ventilation and be able to accommodate for that. Now your cardiovascular system is operating right at 95%. You can't increase that any further. So that's going to be the main rate limiting factor when it comes to delivering oxygen to your muscles. It gets into the bloodstream just fine from the lungs. It's now got to go from the blood to your muscles and that's depending on your cardiac output. Now, some last little facts here. As you could imagine, if you're already operating at 95% of your maximal cardiac output, if you have any heart disease that reduces the ability of your heart to perform at that cardiac output, you're going to subsequently significantly reduce your athletic performance. Now, normal cardiac output is going to actually reduce in all the people, particularly if they don't keep up with exercise. And that's why exercise is so important to prolong life because it helps to reduce cardiovascular mortality. And if you're able to keep that heart nice and happy and make sure that you're able to increase your cardiac output if you need to, then that's going to prolong life. Now, body heat and exercise, you're obviously going to produce a lot of heat. At the end of the day, all your food, gets eventually turned into heat. Either that's through muscle contraction, chemical reactions, overcoming viscous resistance in your joints or your blood flow, everything eventually turns to heat. So if you're going to increase your activity and suddenly burn a lot more fuel, then you're going to obviously increase your body temperature. 
you're going to do that in a hot environment, you could result in heat stroke. If you start to get above 106 to 108 Fahrenheit or 41 to 42 degrees Celsius, you start to destroy some of your tissues, particularly your nervous tissues or your brain cells. So you can feel weak, exhausted, get headaches, dizziness, etc. And that could also result in collapse and unconsciousness. So the treatment is just to cool down the body. Other issues could be the loss of body fluids from sweating too much or the loss of salt within that sweat. And losing that salt can actually result in tissue edema, particularly of the brain. So similar to heat stroke can result in neurological signs. So you need to replenish both fluids and also salts as well, unless you've acclimatized to the heat and you're producing more aldosterone, which is going to absorb more of that salt within your spec glands. The last thing we'll mention here is drugs and athletic performance. There is some talk that caffeine increases your athletic performance. Male sex hormones will obviously increase athletic performance by increasing the muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy, etc. but it actually does increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and decreases testicular function. And then the last ones here are amphetamines and cocaine or stimulants can increase performance, but obviously you have the risk of overuse and the deterioration of your performance. So that is the end of this textbook. We've managed to do it. Thank you for going on this journey together. If you'd like to support the channel after going through all that, you can do so through the Patreon link. Otherwise, just feel free to drop a comment and good luck for any exams that you may have and for the future.